Jackie Garner from Georgia Tech, and welcome to the first teaching award for the FMA. So I want to give you a little bit of background for this award. Uh, about eight years ago, actually it's been ten years now, ten years ago FMA started in a Conmetric series here at FMA. So every year we have at least one, if not more, a Conmetric series where people are introducing um, new techniques in econometrics. So two years ago, I suggested, along with Michelle, to the board, Michelle Lou, our director at FMA, to the board that we should have pedagogy series uh, here at FMA because many people are doing research, but all of us have to teach at our universities. And let's get some techniques for good pedagogy. So last year was our inaugural pedagogy, pedagogy series, and we had a presentation yesterday in that pedagogy series, and the award, we decided to also give teaching award. And so we had 30 uh, submissions for the award, and I, along with Jennifer and Andrew Metric, uh, decided the final. And so uh, they were all really good. They were really good, wouldn't you agree, Jennifer? They were all very good, and it was difficult to narrow it down to three. But you have a treat. We have the three presenters here. So I'm going to just introduce their names to you, and then, of course, they'll, they'll introduce their presentations. Um, so we've got uh, David Offenberg, Jack Triffs, and Jonathan Godby. And so they will present their their work here in a minute. And um, the prize, the, the, uh, we're going to have a prize, it's $1,000 um, for the first place winner and $500 for the runner-ups. And this award is generously supported by the AICPA and the CM, CGMA. And we have Ken Witt here that, that's going to talk to you uh, for a minute and then we'll get back. Okay, so I want you to uh, meet Ken. And he'll tell you a little bit about the award and what they do. Yes. So thanks, Jacqueline. Sure. Uh, on behalf of the Association of Certified Professional Accountants, it's my pleasure to say a few words about this award. Uh, the association is the unified voice of the AICPA and SEMA. And, and these are the membership uh, bodies for designation holders of the CPA designation and the CGMA designation. So most of you are probably familiar with the CPA designation, which is sort of the, the big you know, uh, public accounting designation, uh, premier accounting designation in the US and around the world. Um, but the CGMA designation uh, distinguishes professionals who have an advanced proficiency in finance, operations, strategy, and, and management. Uh, and we think the CGMA designation is very attractive to finance students who have an interest in pursuing uh, uh, their careers in corporate finance roles, uh, a wide range of corporate finance role, roles, and we've created a learning, a learning program, an online learning program, the Finance Leadership Program, to facilitate uh, their learning uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, pass the exams that, that are involved in the uh, CGMA designation. So that's why we are partnering uh, with the uh, FMA and sponsoring this award, and, and we also uh, uh, are, are active in the student conference uh, that's held every spring. Um, so uh, another important part of the mission of uh, the association is to you know, support professionals uh, in business and support the research and teaching activities of you academics who uh, prepare our students for their careers. So uh, with that, I'd like to extend my congratulations to uh, this year's finalists and uh, turn it back over to Jack. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to say one, uh, another word or two about the award itself. So the award specifically recognizes innovation in teaching. And so that's the name of the award, the FMA Innovation in Teaching Award. And we want to recognize quality educators and who this forum allows those quality educators to tell you their, how they innovate in the classroom. So we wanted this to be, one, a recognition of their innovation, but two, a mechanism that they could share that with you. And so we will continue these awards in the future. And so we're really lucky 
um, to have this awards, and thanks very much. Um, where did Ken go? Right here. There he is. There's Ken. <laughs> where did he go? So, and, and thank you very much for, for your support. We really appreciate it. So thank You're you welcome. very much. Yep. So before they uh, before they get started, um, we want you to help us choose the award winner. Okay? We want you to help us choose the award. So we have a poll here, and that's and you can do that just on your phone. And um, once we're finished with all the presentations, so don't vote before all the presentations are, are done, okay? So, um, and I'll put that back up there, but we will have an ability to do that. And with that, I'm going to turn over this session to the real stars of the session, and we'll start with David Offenberg. Oh, you're turning over the stars. <laughs> I'm just turning it over to you one of the stars, right? Good morning, I'm David Offenberg from Loyola Marymount University or what we like to call Los Angeles' premier safety school. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see people in the room. I, I, I never know with the FMA whether we're going to be talking to an empty room. So thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see you. I'm talking today about applied financial modeling with peer, with peer critiques. Uh, this is about the semester-long project in my entertainment finance class. Uh, over the course of the semester, each student builds a complete and thorough financial model of a forthcoming film. Uh, they are rigorous and amazing and beautiful. And what you're going to see is that they teach the students both the soft skills that they need to communicate that model and the hard skills they need to actually build the model. And the amazing thing is that it's shockingly easy to grade, despite the fact that it's such a big, thorough model. Uh, so, and as a teaser, um, the impacts are tremendous. About half of my students will place into entertainment finance jobs or internships. And I, you'll see the design is really transferable to not just a lot of different finance courses, but a lot of different disciplines. So today I'm going to give you some background on the course and the project itself. And then I'll talk about the, the key details of the project so that you can understand how it's structured. And then I'll talk more about the impact and the transferability. Uh, and let me start here. Uh, my career goal is to get my students jobs. I love that. I live for that. That's my high. Um, and I, I think the inception of that goal is with a student um, named Brandon Cusick, who I had back in 2010. Uh, Brandon was, or Brandon is brilliant. He should have placed in an investment banking job very easily coming out of any other institution. Uh, but in part because it was 2010, and in part because I didn't prepare him well, he placed in retail insurance sales. So he should have placed in the penthouse of finance jobs, and instead he placed in the stinky basement of finance jobs. Because I failed him. I clearly failed him. I, did, I didn't prepare him for what the market needed, I prepared him for what I knew how to teach. And I don't want to ever fail the next Brandon Cusick. I, I just don't. I think I'm better than that. Uh, and so what I did is I went around, and I knew the, the best path to a good finance job in Los Angeles is real estate. But a colleague had that covered, so I wasn't going to teach that. Uh, the second best path to a good finance job in Los Angeles is film and TV. Uh, because all the major studios are there, all the, many of the independent producers are there, and there's a lot of financial services built around supporting them. And so what I did is I went around and I did about 60 hours of interviews with executives. And I said, what do I need to teach so that my students can get the job? And there were three basic things that came out of that. Uh, one is they need both the hard skills of can they build the model, can they do the math, but they also need the soft skills of can they communicate that information. So they need to be able to communicate it in a, a nice spreadsheet design, first and foremost. It can't just be a complete mess. They also need to be able to write about it in memos and emails, uh, and they need to be able to present it. And so that sounds hard to teach, but you'll see in my design, uh, they actually learn it well. And they do develop the soft skills in addition to the hard skills. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing they said is in the first day of the job, the student's going to have Microsoft Excel on their desktop, and they're going to have a contract on the desk in front of them. And their boss is going to say, put the terms of this contract into Microsoft Excel, into your financial model. And so they need to be really comfortable with contracts and understanding how to read a contract and translate it into a financial model. So that was two. The third thing they said is, because we're filming TV, they should just build a green light model. Uh, a green light model being the financial model the studio uses to decide whether or not to invest in a movie. Because if they can build a really nice green light model, 
then they understand our vernacular, they understand our process, and we could slot them into lots of different jobs. That said, they continued, but we probably won't hire them because, because <coughs> nepotism, favoritism, elitism, but it's cute that you're doing that. Good for you. Uh, and, and so that was my goal then, to make them hire my students. And so let me then talk a little bit about the, the key design uh, of the project, um, the key design elements. Where we start is I assign every single student a forthcoming film. Everybody gets a unique film so that at the end, all of their film models are a little bit different. And that's, that's nice. Um, they start with this set of instructions. You don't, know how, you don't have to know what it says, but I can uh, summarize it for you. They are required to build a data set of 30 comparable movies. And from those 30 comparable movies, they're going to estimate the box office revenue for their film. Um, and they're starting with a blank Excel workbook. So I don't give them any formats. I don't give them any indication of how they're supposed to structure this. That is part of the learning the soft skills. Learning how to start with an email from your boss and build a financial model around it. That's important. Uh, I also don't tell them what makes a movie comparable. They're going to figure that out for themselves. They're going to have to dig into the, the literature and figure out what attributes of the movie make it comparable to, to their film. So for instance, you would know that an R-rated movie is always going to generate less revenue than a PG-13 just because the kids can't go to the R-rated movies like they can with PG-13. They're going to dig into the literature. They're going to have robust assumptions based on the literature that support what makes a movie comparable. I also don't tell them how to estimate the box office revenue. Uh, some are going to do a simple average, some are going to do a weighted average, some are going to do a regression. All those are fine. I don't care what they do, as long as they can support it based on what they're seeing in their data. And so they're going to take a week, they're going to spend about 10 hours doing this, uh, they're going to struggle through it, and when they bring it to class a week later, they get this the first week of class. Uh, in the second week of class, they bring their deliverable in on paper. It's going to come on paper. And again, um, how do I say this without making me look bad? Say it anyway. I get really depressed grading. I get <laughs> right? Because why didn't they learn from me? How could I have taught this better? I hate grading. I really do. And you can imagine in a massive semester long project in a financial model, there's a ton to grade if you want to be nitpicky. Um, so I don't grade till the very end of the semester. When they bring it in on paper, uh, they're going to hand them in to me and then I'm going to redistribute them to the class. And so everybody gets one of their, their peers' models. Um, and I should mention, when they turn these in after the, the, the first week, they are mm, just unprofessional. <laughs> they, are, they are a mess. They, they look about like this. I'm sure you've seen these. It's usually in a three-point font. Nothing's well labeled. There's no title. There's no caption. There's uh, errors all over the place. It's, it's a first attempt, and I'm perfectly happy with that because this is the start of the process of learning how to build a financial model that communicates information well. And so what happens, they have a week now to critique their classmates model. And this is the key thing that I'm talking about today, apply financial model and peer critiques. Because when they're critiquing their classmates model, now they're thinking critically about spreadsheet design. Now they're thinking about how can I communicate this information better? Because they have the A and they have the B. They have their student, their, their classmates model, and they have their model, and they can see, oh, they solve for this part this way, I solve for it this way. Maybe they did it better and I can learn from that. Or maybe I did it better and I can offer them some guidance to help it improve theirs. Or maybe we both did it terribly, but in my mind I can see a third way to do it that would be an improvement over both of these. And so now they're thinking critically about spreadsheet design and they're making their model better and they're making their classmates model better. So that eventually when they turn it in, what I have to grade is beautiful. It's clean, it's neat, it's professional, and it looks like something that would come out of a corporation, like we would want it to. So they're gonna have a week to critique their classmates' model. They can critique on the rules. Did they follow the rules? Did they format it well? Did they do the math correctly? Whatever they think would be helpful, they're gonna write, write on that paper in pen and give their, their classmate guidance. Uh, they'll do that, they'll, and then after a week, they'll turn it in. And that's when they get a second sheet of instructions that looks about like this. And then we're going to do this six times over the course of the semester. So when they get these instructions, they're going to uh, first clean up that first deliverable. 
and then build the second one. The second one asks them to build a production and marketing budget. So they're, they're doing the budget, uh, projecting the, the expenses. So they're going to clean up the first one and then turn that second one in all a week later. And we'll do this six times. In the third deliverable, they're going to estimate the non-theatrical revenues, the, the DVDs, the Netflix, the HBO. In the fourth deliverable, they're going to deal with the residuals and the collective bargaining agreements, so it gets a little messy, and they're going to just do some amortizations. In the fifth deliverable, they're going to build the pro forma and estimate the NPV. And then in the sixth deliverable, they're going to do some sensitivity analysis around that NPV. Uh, and so all along, mind you, we're building in certain Excel skills. So in the second deliverable, they have to do a VLOOKUP. In the third, they're going to do a pivot table. In the fourth, they're going to do match and index formulas. In the fifth, they're going to learn the limitations of the NPV formula in Excel. And all through, we're doing contracts. So in the third deliverable, there's a distribution contract. In the fourth deliverable, there's the collective bargaining agreements and an employment contract. In the fifth deliverable, they have to deal with some state tax code. Tax code is awesome. And so they're getting used to reading these documents that they're going to have to eventually build into their financial models. And what they turn in at the end is beautiful. I'm going to share one with you. This is from a student from a couple years ago who ended up placing at Disney. Uh, and what you're going to see, and I'm going to flip through it very fast because it's massive, it's professional, it looks great. All the work of one student in one semester. You can see it's rigorously backed by assumptions. They're going to end up with 150 to 200 well-documented assumptions. And it is amazing. And so this is, mind you, this is scanned from paper. She turned this in on paper, and I've scanned it and shown it to you here. So you can see exactly what her interviewers are seeing. Because the goal then is that they have this beautiful financial model on paper. And keep in mind, this is one semester of work by one student. It's a beautiful financial model on paper, resulting in an NPV and a sensitivity analysis. They bring it to their interviews, and their interviewers are blown away. The, the, the folks who said, we will never hire your students, they changed their mind. <laughs> in summary, they changed their mind. Uh, now, mind you, uh, this is a massive project. In any given semester, about 10% of the students will finish it all the way. And I'm actually fine with that. Uh, the other 90%, they recognize the value of it because they see, oh my goodness, if I have this solid model on paper and I can bring it to my interviews, I'm going to get a job. And so when the semester ends, I start getting emails. Can we keep working on my model? Can, I, can you help me on my model over the break, over the summer? And we do that. Imagine that, a project in class where they keep learning after the semester ends. It's amazing. And it's not just right after the semester ends. This is the work that they would typically do six years out, six years after they graduate. And so even for the first two years while they're moving on from the first job to the second job, they still bring these models to their interviews because it's still the best documentation they have of their professional abilities that they can share in a job interview. Uh, and so that, but the, the key thing here, though, is again that they're critiquing each other. The peer critiques that at each step, all six steps along the way, they're critiquing each other, helping each other build a, a better end product. Uh, Impact-wise, I mentioned at the beginning that about 50% of my students get jobs in entertainment finance, uh, and these are, I should mention, incredibly competitive jobs. I placed a student at NBC Universal this summer. Uh, her incoming class, the people who came in with her, were Columbia, Wharton, Northwestern, and Loyola Marymount. We are the school that has traditionally placed our students in the wet, stinky basement of the sales. And suddenly we're competing with really great schools. Uh, historically, we've only placed people, our students, into these uh, good entertainment finance jobs through nepotism, quite frankly. Uh, and now anybody who puts in the work can, can actually get into one of these jobs. Um, and uh, the, the companies that are reaching out to me, I had eight employers reach out to me in the first three weeks of this semester. And these are companies you would know. Lionsgate, CBS TV, Paramount, Amazon Studios, all coming to me looking, and, and I, I, I'm not bragging, I'm proud. I'm proud of the fact that this model has attracted so much attention from name brand employers who heard that I produce good students. Um, I knew I had made it big, Last year, when I got a call out of the blue from WWE Studios, the wrestling people. <laughs> That's what I knew I'd make. 
Um, so they place well, they place into very competitive jobs, and 50% on average will place into these good entertainment finance jobs. But the other 50%, I'm not just kicking them to the curb, they also place in great jobs because they have the bait and switch. It looks like it's a film and TV model, but really it's an applied financial model. And any employer who sees that you can build this extensive of a model that's this robust with these kind of assumptions is gonna to wanna to hire you. So a lot of them go into real estate because again, that is the dominant career path in Los Angeles and finance. A lot go to Silicon Valley to work in the tech companies there. But in a typical semester, 95% of my students will end up in good corporate finance jobs. Not a single one has ended up in uh, the retail insurance sales. Uh, so the impact is very obvious, it's very, very clear. And the transferability of the design, um, I've, we have a, a part-time instructor this semester who's teaching a commercial banking class for us. He's using the same iterative process where they build a little critique, build a little critique, build a little critique. He's using that in a commercial banking course. And so in that class, they're building credit recommendations for the bank's credit committee. And they're using the exact same process to build out the same sort of uh, model, but in a different context. I've also been working with a professor at another university who's thinking about building this into a healthcare finance class. Because just like you can do this with a $100 million movie, you can do it with a $100 million hospital wing, where you can uh, model Medicare and Medicaid uh, reimbursements and population growth and the market for healthcare, all these things. Uh, you can do it with a rocket engine. You can do it with any capital investment. And really, you can do it with any large-scale project where uh, you want the students to turn in something neat and clean at the end. And grading-wise, the grading is really easy because by the end of the semester, the students already know what their grade's gonna be. They already know what they've done and what they haven't done. And so, I really don't have to grade much. And my, my pledge to them is, um, I'm gonna grade you on 25 items. And those 25 items are gonna be picked at random each semester. I'm gonna put them into a rubric. And each one, I'm gonna grade pass-fail. Is this something you would want to put in front of an interviewer? Is this something you want to put in front of a client or not? If it is, you get the points. If it's not, you don't get the points. And so it's really easy to grade. I can grade them all very quickly. I end up with a nice distribution of grades, which I then have to curve upwards. But, <laughs> but the grading takes almost no time at all because what they've turned in at the end is beautiful and clean, and they already know what their grade's going to be. So it's, it's a really nice uh, it's been a really nice project for my students. It's helped them get into jobs they thought they would never have a chance to get into. It's been a really nice project for me because it achieves my career goal of getting my students into jobs, uh, good jobs, uh, by building the soft skills and the hard skills that they need all along the way. Uh, I want to, before I wrap up, I do want to thank AICPA uh, for sponsoring this. I think it's awesome that the AICPA is committing resources to sponsoring great teaching. Uh, I, I want to thank Jennifer and Jacqueline and Andrew Metric for serving on the panel. I want to congratulate Jonathan and Jack. I think it's awesome that we made it this far. And thank you for your time.